Okay, hey. welcome to the webinar, The Green New Deal, The World Needs Now, Alternative Trade Rules for Climate Action. I'm Karen hansen Kuhn with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. As we consider the Green New Deals that are emerging around the world, in the US, Europe, and elsewhere, as well as extreme inequality and the challenge of COVID, we need to be thinking both about what happens within each of our countries and how we relate to each other. A lot of the solutions that are emerging, of course, involve strengthening local economies, finding ways to make supply chains more resilient, especially for food. But we live in a global economy. The first director of the World Trade Organization said that they were writing the constitution for a single global economy. The WTO and the web of bilateral and plurilateral trade deals that are popping up like mushrooms around the world constrain governments, constrain public policy, and can endanger human rights. And unlike the Paris Accords, these, these rules have teeth. They can result in billions of dollars in fines and enormous pressure on governments to give in to corporate pressure for privatization and deregulation. But we care about trade rules because they affect our lives. They affect things like the food we eat, um, whether there's pesticides in our foods, how much medicines cost, um, and of course, the possibility of enacting better climate policies. They also condition how we relate to other economies. Under the current free trade agreements, uh, corporations are empowered to play the rules in one country off those in another. Um, they can flood developing countries, for example, with cheap imports that displace local production. On the other hand, they can be a forum for bringing food in when crops fail. Uh, the rules reflect choices. The choices matter, and we can make other choices. So today, we'll hear from some really inspiring speakers about what those choices are. We'll have two rounds of comments uh, from each of the speakers, and then we'll open up the webinar to your questions and comments. So throughout the webinar, uh, please type your questions or comments into the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and we'll gather those and get through as many as we can uh, as time allows. So before I introduce the speakers, I'd also like to explain that this is both the third webinar in the series on the Green New Deals the world needs now, and the first in a new series on trade rules for climate action. Those, that series will happen at this time on Thursdays. Um, so today we'll take a broad look at why trade matters. And then we have two more uh, already scheduled that are coming up. The first is extractivism, human rights, and investor state dispute settlement, hard law versus soft law, which will happen next Thursday on May 28th. And, and then next, confronting the free trade model trade treaties, energy, and Green New Deals on June 4th. Uh, these will, like this webinar, be bilingual. Uh, so presentations will be happening in Spanish and English. And we really hope we will uh, have participants from a number of countries. So to begin with, we've asked each panelist to tell us briefly, why should climate activists care about trade rules? and how, as progressive groups, how we can differentiate our proposals from right-wing nationalism on one hand and neoliberal free trade on the other. So our first speaker is Avi Lewis. Avi is a documentary filmmaker, journalist, and lecturer in journalism and media studies at Rutgers University. His 25-year journalism career has spanned award-winning, theatrically re released documentaries to local news for reporting. He has appeared on TV networks worldwide. In 2017, he co-founded and is now strategic director of The Leap, an organization launched to upend our collective response to the crisis of climate, climate inequality, and racism. Avi? Um, thank you, Karen. Um, saludos a, a todos. And I'm um, so excited to see 
so many friends and comrades from around the world already in the chat. It's an honor to be here with you all and uh, speaking on this critical subject in a time when the, uh, when the impacts of the last 30 years of neoliberal global trading rules have never been more devastating um, to, uh, to our hopes for, for a safe and healthy future for all of us. And that's equally true in the context of pandemic as it is for climate. For me, my understanding of climate and trade and the intersections and the impact of one on the other, uh, it will surprise no one who knows me to know that they've been deeply um, imprinted by the analysis of Naomi Klein, uh, who in her um, masterwork, uh, This Changes Everything in 2014, laid out this extraordinary historical overview that I want to briefly start with. Let's just go back 30 years to the late 80s and early 90s, which was really the beginning of this phase of neoliberal trade negotiations and global climate negotiations, which both started right at the same historical moment in the late 80s, the formation uh, leading up to the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, the formation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the scientists who advise governments. You had the beginning of the, uh, the, the first free trade agreement between Canada and the United States. NAFTA was being negotiated. The World Trade Organization was being formed. So these two global processes started simultaneously. The trade process, as Karen said in the introduction, had teeth, had severe penalties and economic consequences for countries and parties that violated their rules. The climate negotiations were utterly voluntary and in fact embedded in all of those initial uh, uh, climate uh, structures and formations like the UNFCCC. Um, the, the, there was a, it was absolutely forbidden in the climate talks to pass any global climate uh, regime that violated international trading rules, while the trading rules never even mentioned climate. And in fact, as we've seen over the last 30 years, those trading rules have locked in a global economic system of maximum overproduction uh, in a few countries, maximum overconsumption in a few rich countries, uh, the highest emissions, highest consumption global economic model that humanity has ever been capable of. And it has been locked in uh, by global trading rules. And in the same time, the climate crisis has, not surprisingly, exploded. So uh, let's fast forward quickly, because I'm just going to take five minutes as asked in this first salvo, to uh, 2018 to October of 2018 and the landmark uh, intergovernmental, climate, uh, intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, uh, which made it clear for all of us that 1.5 degrees of warming is really the hard limit on a safe future for humanity and for many of the other crises we face, ecological extinction and other crises. It's absolutely critical that we cut our emissions globally in half in the next decade. And that report unforgettably said that keeping global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. We have to change our food system fundamentally. We have to change our energy system fundamentally. We need more localization, more public ownership and control in everything, uh, in every aspect of society. All of those changes come into direct, irrevocable conflict with the logic of neoliberal trade. We have to abolish, smash, completely reconfigure, not just all of the international trading rules, but all of the pillars of the neoliberal system. And I would say these challenges go right down to classical economic doctrines like competitive advantage, the notion that each country should specialize in a particular set of export goods um, this uh, in itself is on a collision course with the localization of economies that we need for a safe and healthy future for us all. The pandemic in the last couple of months has been like a floodlight exposing the fatal implications of this logic, not just in creating the climate crisis, uh, but in this pu unprecedented public health crisis that we all face as well. So when you see rich countries ignoring dignity, decency, and rules the way they always have in the trading system in the naked pursuit of their own self-interest in securing 
personal protective equipment and ventilators and drugs and other things. And in, undoubtedly, we'll see this with the race for vaccines as well. We see the inequality of what this uh, neoliberal trading system and economic logic has created. And it is literally translating into deaths for countries that cannot secure what they need and lives in countries uh, that have that uh, economic advantage. So that's the opening salvo. The, the reason climate uh, activists uh, care about the trading system is because it has been one of the ways that this economic logic has been locked in. And this economic logic is a massive boulder that we have to get off the path on the way to a safe and healthy future for, for all living things. Thanks, Alvi. I mean, it's certainly true that the trade rules in so many ways just lock in business as usual when what we really need is to be changing course dramatically. Uh, so next we have Lucia Barsana, a re researcher with the Transnational Institute and its trade and investment team. Her work is focused on investment protection and investor to state dispute settlement in EU agreements. Previously, she coordinated the campaign against the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, for Ecologistas en Acción in Spain. Lucia? Um, hola, buenas tardes a todas. Yo voy a hablar en, en castellano. Igual dejo un poco de tiempo porque explicaron que abajo hay un botón para interpretaciones, así que ahí se puede elegir el, el idioma. Eh, bueno, yo cuando me invitaron a este panel, es verdad que lo primero que pensé fue que qué interesante que estamos en un momento en el que resulta cada vez más fácil conectar eh, los discursos sobre clima con comercio, ¿no? Algo que, si bien era obvio, no era tan fácil, sobre todo en, algunos, en algunas organizaciones que solamente trabajaban, por ejemplo, temas de clima, ¿no? Eh, como comentaba Karen, yo eh, empecé trabajando en Ecologistas en Acción, eh, que es una organización en, que, que está en, bueno, de medio ambiente en España. ¿no? Y enseguida para mí fue como muy obvio y muy lógico la necesidad de poner atención sobre las políticas europeas de comercio y de inversión y sobre todo cómo estas están impactando a países del sur global a través de las empresas europeas, sobre todo, pero bueno, también de Estados Unidos, eh, Japón o de otros de otros, de otros países, ¿no? Pero en mi caso, mi foco siempre ha sido, pues, mirar desde, desde Europa, ¿no? Eh, fue aquí cuando enseguida caí sobre algunos datos que a mí me impactaron mucho eh, sobre cómo las políticas de comercio, de hecho, están perjudicando, pues, por ejemplo, la, la pérdida de biodiversidad. Eh, la, eh, de hecho, hay, hay estudios que informan que una tercera parte de de la pérdida de biodiversidad está directamente relacionada con la producción que se destina al comercio internacional, ¿no? O, por ejemplo, cómo acelera también el cambio climático, ¿no? Es decir, eh, si pensamos en las estructuras globales de comercio, es bastante obvio y bastante lógico ver que para que esto se dé, hace falta... Lucía, por favor, down, sorry. Sorry. Para que, para que esto se dé, hace falta unas infraestructuras que consumen mucha energía y a la vez van a producir emisiones de, de CO2, ¿no? eh, Esto es, de alguna manera, aplicable a cualquier eh, acuerdo de comercio global, ¿no? Pero yo quería aprovechar para traer un acuerdo sobre el cual estamos trabajando ahora mismo en Europa, sobre todo porque es un acuerdo que está impactando políticas de clima que se están ahora mismo debatiendo en, en, alguno, en algunos países y este se llama el Tratado sobre la Carta de la Energía. Este tratado fue negociado en los años 90 con la idea de proteger las inversiones y los inversores en combustibles fósiles, ¿no? en combustibles convencionales, gas, petróleo... Eh, y por lo tanto eh, ahora mismo lo que estamos viendo es lo que incluía estos acuerdos, una de las partes más peligrosas por así decirlo, tenía que ver con los derechos y los privilegios que estaban otorgando a las empresas transnacionales ¿no? 
eh, sobre todo las que provenían del sector de la energía eh, convencional, ¿no? como estoy diciendo. Entonces, ¿qué está pasando? Que a este tipo de protección lo que estaba permitiendo es que si algún inversor veía que su inversión estaba siendo perjudicada por una política que estaba siendo mmm, valorada en algún país, este podía denunciar al país haciendo uso de los tribunales privados de arbitraje, ¿no? que están exclusivamente diseñados para proteger a las inversiones, a las inversiones privadas. ¿no? Entonces fue a raíz de que empezamos a ver unos ejemplos muy... Eh, muy peligrosos para, para los países que estaban tomando medidas serias contra el cambio climático, que decidimos iniciar una campaña sobre esto. ¿no? Entonces, eh, quería dar dos ejemplos para que entendamos un poquito a qué nos referimos cuando digo que, esto, que este acuerdo puede impedir, por ejemplo, alguna acción en relación al clima. ¿no? Eh, hay una empresa, una empresa sueca, y solo voy a dar un ejemplo mejor porque tampoco hay mucho tiempo, una empresa sueca que se llama Vattenfall, en el 2009 demandó a Alemania reclamando un, eh, 1,5 mil millones de euros a Alemania a raíz de que una comunidad, una comunidad local, o sea, la ciudad de Hamburgo, quisiera aprobar una legislación que endurecía de alguna manera los, las regulaciones sobre medio ambiente de una empresa de carbón que estaba operando en esa ciudad. Eh, a raíz de esto, Alemania recibió esta demanda. Lo que sucedió fue que en el 2011 esta, esta regulación de medio ambiente se relajó muchísimo, se bajó muchísimo los estándares y realmente no vio luz nunca la regulación que la ciudadanía de Hamburgo estaba esperando. ¿no? Más adelante escuchamos algunas declaraciones de los políticos de Hamburgo que decían que esto había sucedido... Eh, esto había sucedido precisamente porque ellos no querían enfrentarse a estas demandas millonarias, por lo cual preferían y les merecía la pena ceder al chantaje de, las, de la empresa multinacional, en este caso de Vattenfall. ¿no? Eh, esto es como algunos ejemplos para que quede claro cómo el comercio, de hecho, acelera el cambio climático y además puede impedir cualquier avance hacia una transición eh, justa, ecológica, que estemos buscando, ¿no? Um, hacia la pregunta que hacía también Karen de, de, bueno, de, de, de cómo esto también está haciendo que surjan distintas visiones políticas sobre cómo, cómo, a, cómo atacar el tema del cambio climático, es verdad que en los últimos años ha cogido mucho, o sea, las sociedades han cogido mucha conciencia sobre los daños del problema de la crisis climática, ¿no? En esto ha surgido un negacionismo político organizado alrededor de la idea de la prórroga de la era de los combustibles fósiles y esto está principalmente siendo liderado con el presidente de Estados Unidos, con Trump, pero también se han dado otras visiones de eh, organizaciones que están pensando cómo, com, cómo combatir, hacer frente a estos problemas climáticos. ¿no? Y a mí me parece más interesante poner el debate y centrar el debate sobre estas otras miradas en las cuales estamos viendo que hay también divergencias de opiniones, es decir, están los que creen que la transición ecológica es compatible con el sistema socioeconómico actual y están los que creen que hay que cambiar ese sistema socioeconómico para eh, precisamente combatir la raíz del problema de, que ha causado el cambio climático. ¿no? Por lo cual lo dejo aquí con la idea de, de, que, este, de que, bueno, que ese debate realmente a lo mejor podría ser más interesante que las políticas negacionistas. Gracias. Thanks, Lucia. I, I do think it's really important uh, to think about these complementary agreements. Um, like the Energy Charter, there's also a lot of bilateral investment treaties that have some of the same um, restrictions or the same freedoms for corporations. Um, so next, we have Arthur Stamolis. Uh, Arthur is Executive Director of Citizens Trade Campaign a U.S.-based coalition of labor, environmental, family, farm, faith, and consumer organizations working together to improve international trade policy. He got involved in trade organ organizing after participating in the 1999 battle in Seattle, 
where he was inspired by the power of cross-sector, cross-border coalition building. Prior to joining Citizens Trade Campaign, he served as Director of Government Affairs for the Clean Air Council. His writing has appeared in numerous magazines and newspapers. Arthur? Thank you, uh, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so I'm gonna describe how I first got involved in trade work 20 years ago, uh, some of the new obstacles we face recruiting people to this work today, and how we might overcome some of those obstacles. Uh, so as Karen said, I got involved in trade policy organizing in earnest uh, after participating in the 1999 WTO protests in Seattle. Uh, and there were a ton of inspiring things that happened during that week of protest. Uh, but even before the big demonstrations of November 30th that physically stopped the opening of the ministerial, um, there had been days of protest before that, and each of those days had a different theme, labor, agriculture, the environment, and so on. Uh, and I was particularly moved and inspired early in the week when steel workers came and marched in the environmental protest. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, labor and environmental activists were very actively pitted against one another in the United States those days, uh, particularly in the Pacific Northwest with the timber wars going on over logging. So to see you know, literal tree huggers and workers from saw and paper mills marching with one another, uh, that was a big deal. Um, and even if you didn't experience that, that sort of animosity among labor and enviros uh, back in the 80s and the 90s, um, you know, even today you can probably imagine how if you had industrial unions leading front and center in a climate march, how encouraging that would be. So, you know, not only seeing people come together across issue areas, uh, but seeing the power that we had when we came together across issue areas and across borders, uh, that was very pivotal for me and for a lot of other activists at that time. Uh, because, of course, the thing about the battle in Seattle was we won, right? Activists and advocates from around the world uh, went up against some of the most powerful economic interests in human history, and we kicked their butts. Uh, you know, stopping the millennial round of WTO expansion, um, you know, that was something that many had, had said was inevitable, that this was going to happen. This was back in a time when political pundits were were constantly bragging that we'd reached the end of history, that there was no alternative to corporate neoliberalism and all of that. So, you know, moving from the 90s into the early 2000s, uh, trade policy organizing back then was one of the sexiest issues on the left to be working on, right? Not only did the battle in Seattle spotlight a bunch of cool protest tactics, and not only were we inspiring people by winning, uh, but at that point, we on the left were the ones who were defining what trade and globalization should look like. In other words, as more and more people were recognizing that business as usual in the global economy was messed up, that it was not working for them, that it was not working for their communities, that it was not working for people around the world, they were looking to the left for solutions. Uh, today, that is no longer the case. Voices on the left are no longer the loudest voices attacking corporate globalization and promoting alternatives. Uh, here in the U.S., Donald Trump and his mega rallies and his Twitter account are much, much louder than we are. And so, you know, for Americans who already have some right-wing inclinations, uh, if you're pissed about trade, Trump is there welcoming you, welcoming you with open arms. Uh, and that's extremely dangerous just in and of itself. To have right-wing types coalesce around Trump's demagoguery uh, is very, very bad. Unfortunately... One of the even more troubling trends we're seeing lately, you know, is not only the people influenced by America first gravitating to Trump rather than being awakened or recruiting by the left. Um, not only that, but the left itself is increasingly seeding this space without much fight. So in recent years, I've repeatedly heard people on the left say they don't want to work on trade because it's, quote unquote, Trump's issue. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for this. We don't have time to go through all of them today. But let me just flag one of the problems that I think we could push back on and make some difference on. Uh, one of the things we have to overcome in the U.S. is expanding understanding and representation of who trade policy affects, uh, especially in terms of race and gender analysis, and especially in terms of climate analysis. 
Uh, the main depiction in the U.S. of somebody who's affected by bad trade policy, you know, in terms of framing by Trump, but frankly, you know, the norm even well before Trump, you know, that main depiction of somebody angry about trade is a 55-year-old white guy with a hard hat. Uh, when we consider who's affected by trade-related job loss, we are not usually encouraged to think of, say, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan as a trade story, or of the disproportionate impact that the global race to the bottom has on people of color and women domestically here in the U United States, and of course globally in Mexico and El Salvador and China and elsewhere. Um, and so in the US, where most trade organizing and most trade thinking is still done through the lens of outsourcing and jobs and wages, um, if we wanna get more people involved in the trade fight, thinking about who is included and who is excluded when we talk about outsourcing is a serious issue because right now too many people being ex excluded in those narratives. Uh, and beyond that, of course, we need to do a better job promoting understanding of the myriad of other issues that trade policy affects, particularly climate. Um, so at their heart, trade agreements are about letting corporations invest wherever the hell they want to then ship their products wherever the hell they want, free from community imposed laws, regulations, court decisions that might get in these corporations away. So if you want to ban fracking under the St. Lawrence River, that's a trade violation. If you want to stop a pipeline from moving tar sands from Alberta to refineries and ports down in Texas, that's a trade violation. Uh, you can do literally everything right as an environmental campaigner, build public awareness around an issue, organize new constituencies, win elections, get new laws passed. You know, you can do that years and years of organizing, win on all fronts, and corporations can still use these trade deals to swoop and uh, get draconian penalties imposed and thus get the laws that you fought so hard for overturned. Um, and so there are actually already provisions in the U.S. version of the Green New Deal that mention trade uh, and mention at least some of these problems, but we need to do a lot more to get people to understand them. And I think I'll turn it back over to Karen now. Thank you. Great. I was just going to remind you, I, I think that's so important. We have to be working across sectors, finding those commonalities, but also across borders. Um, that is one thing. If you look at these agreements, it is just right there in black and white that these are for the corporations to allow them to go across borders as they'd like. Um, so in so much of our trade activism over the last two decades, uh, it has been this cross-border work, finding commonalities with people in other countries uh, that has made that work. So next, we have um, a view from Mexico. Um, Alberto Arroyo is a recently retired researcher and professor at the Autonomous Metropolitan University in Mexico. He's been involved in research and action network on trade and investment agreements since 1991 and is currently a member of the Latin American platform Better Without FTAs. From 2013 to 2015, he served on an international commission of experts to hold a hearing on bilateral investment treaties in Ecuador and develop alternative proposals. Alberto? Gracias por la invitación. Da mucho gusto estar aquí con ustedes. Ustedes dispensen que es el único que no hablo inglés, pero bueno, voy a hablar en español. Yo creo que hay una coincidencia muy, muy grande entre todos los que hemos hablado en que solucionar prácticamente cualquiera de los problemas que hemos tocado implica salirse del marco actual de negociaciones. Bajo el marco actual, bajo la teoría actual neoliberal, no hay posibilidad de solucionar las cosas. No es cuestión de cambiar tal o cual artículo, cambiar tal o cual parte del tratado. Hay que negociar bajo otro parámetro, bajo otras ideas, eh, como la única forma de solucionar las cosas. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué digo esto? Porque cuando se habla de libre comercio, suena muy bonito, porque se incluye la palabra libertad. Entonces, mucha gente cree que hablar de libre comercio es la libertad de que yo pueda vender mis pupusas del Salvador o tortillas mexicanas en Estados Unidos y ellos puedan vender cosas aquí como una libertad para intercambiar. 
Si fuera solamente eso, bueno, estaríamos hablando de otra cosa y entonces hablaríamos de que hay cosas que no hay que meter a libre comercio, decidir cuáles, cuáles sí, cuáles no, y llegar a un acuerdo equilibrado de intercambio de mercancías. Pero no es de eso lo que estamos hablando. Estamos hablando de que absolutamente toda nuestra vida, nuestros valores, nuestros derechos, nuestro consumo, eh, nuestras relaciones, tienen que guiarse por una única ley suprema que se llama maximizar la ganancia. Es, todo está organizado para intercambiar maximizando la ganancia. Y esto está por encima de los derechos. ¿no? Eh, si yo no hago negocio con la vacuna contra el coronavirus, pues no la voy a sacar. ¿no? Así de simple. Los del derecho a la salud no está por encima del derecho comercial. Entonces, cuando criticamos estos tratados de libre comercio, lo que estamos criticando es una orientación general prácticamente de todas las negociaciones en distintos marcos que se guían por esta idea de hay que garantizar el maximizar la ganancia. Incluso en el clima, ustedes recuerdan una de las grandes discusiones que ganamos en parte, pero en los hechos ahí está. Se decía que no se iba a enfrentar el cambio climático si no era negocio para las empresas enfrentarlo. Y si a partimos de ahí, pues ya estamos fregados. ¿no? Si no es negocio para las, para las empresas enfrentar el cambio climático, no lo van a hacer. Entonces, todo está supeditado a que sea negocio. No hay valores por encima de eso, no hay una orientación distinta por, por arriba de eso. Entonces, más que renegociar, cambiar tal o cual aspecto de los tratados de libre comercio o de los tratados ambientales o de los acuerdos de propiedad intelectual o de inversiones, lo que tenemos que hacer es pensar un modelo distinto, eh, lo cual no es fácil ni vamos a poder tratarlo aquí en cinco minutos que tenemos. Bueno, tres que me quedan, ¿no? Pero creo que hay que dejar primero sentado esa idea de que si no pensamos fuera de los parámetros actuales, no vamos a encontrar solución. Y todos de los que hemos hablado aquí que están en esa orientación. Es que me parece que es muy importante resaltar, re, resaltar eso. Eh, Creo que ya entrando más en concreto en los acuerdos comerciales que están actualmente en curso, creo que es muy difícil para la gente cuando uno le plantea así el marco completo, hay que pensar de ese otro parámetro y vamos a discutir ese parámetro, etc. Tiene que ver cosas concretas. Voy a referirme a algunas de esas cosas concretas. Una primera es que cualquier acuerdo comercial no debe incluir otros temas que no sean estrictamente comerciales. Si podemos sentarnos a platicar, yo tengo excedente en tales productos, quiero venderlos a ti, y a cambio de eso, ¿qué te dejo entrar aquí? Y entonces, bueno, negociamos un acuerdo de equilibrio, de complementación entre lo que tú produces y que yo no puedo producir porque no tengo recursos eh, o porque no tengo la tecnología y lo que yo te puedo vender. Entonces, lleguemos a un acuerdo de qué estamos dispuestos a abrir y qué no estamos dispuestos a abrir. Eh, esta es una primera idea. Y no meter todos los demás temas. Derechos de los inversionistas, este, propiedad intelectual, eh, supeditar los derechos laborales y los eh, derechos humanos y los derechos ambientales a la lógica de la ganancia, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Entonces, no somos porque por ahí nos han atacado de que estamos pensando en un mundo que ya no existe, ¿no? Un mundo cerrado, aislado, un país de otro. No estamos pensando en eso. Estamos pensando en integrarnos en el mundo de una manera distinta, bajo valores distintos, bajo parámetros distintos. Estamos buscando integrarnos, complementando y no compitiendo y supeditando todo a la ganancia. Esto implica que hay cosas que ciertamente no hay que meter en nuestros tratados. Eh, servicios públicos, por ejemplo. Los servicios públicos en los primeros tratados de libre comercio entraban muy, muy de pasadita, 
muy poco. Cada vez más los tratados nuevos incluyen servicios e incluyen servicios sociales, servicios básicos. Si metemos los servicios que son un derecho humano, como el derecho a la salud, el derecho a la educación, los metemos en una lógica de comercio, deja de ser derecho. Si yo para acceder a la salud necesito pagar, pues ya no es derecho, ya es una mercancía. Entonces tenemos que sacar los servicios públicos de esta lógica comercial. Los servicios públicos tienen que ser un asunto de derechos humanos, no, no de negociaciones comerciales de intercambio, de que si yo soy más eficiente, lo voy a, voy a ofrecer ese servicio, servicio financiero, o servicio de agua, o servicio de electricidad, en tu país, con el único fin de sacar ganancia. Entonces, pues el que no tiene dinero para pagarla, pues se queda sin luz, sin agua, o sin acceso al banco. Un tercer elemento, eh, es, hay otras cosas que no hay que meter en los tratados los derechos de propiedad intelectual. Esos son, estoy planteando solo algunos ejemplos, ¿no? No, no quiero ser exhaustivo. La propiedad intelectual se justifica diciendo que nadie va a invertir en investigación, en innovar, en sacar un producto nuevo, si otros, cualquiera, va a hacer negocio con él. Entonces yo tengo que garantizar que si yo lo invité, pues Exacto. nadie lo puede usar para hacer dinero. Insisto en esto, para hacer dinero. Pero antiguamente, en nuestros países, por lo menos cerca de México, existía una cosa que se llamaba licencias obligatorias. Cuando, por ejemplo, en la salud, el Estado decidía que algo era de necesidad pública, por, por la pandemia, por ejemplo, ahorita, o, o el SIDA, o tantas calamidades de, de salud que ha habido es de salud pública y por tanto me das licencia de producirlo yo a fuerza, no es si quieres o no quieres. Alberto, sí. tenemos que pasar a la segunda ronda. Sí, termino con esto. Digamos, eh, la propiedad intelectual no puede estar por derecha, por encima de los derechos, y en ese sentido, si yo voy a producir una medicina, no para lucrar, sino para repartirla gratuitamente en un sistema público de salud, yo puedo producirla y no tengo que por qué pagarte legalidad. ¿no? Si metemos la propiedad en esta lógica de comercio, la propiedad intelectual, entonces yo no puedo producir la medicina porque tú tienes la exclusividad, se llama monopolio. Entonces, resumo, hay que eh, pensar en un marco distinto, de valores distintos, de orientación distinta. Y un último punto es, si sí, nadie va a venir a invertir en nuestro país si no hay garantía de seguridad jurídica. Pero seguridad jurídica no es lo mismo que superderechos. Hay que garantizar derechos elementales, pero en tribunales nacionales y según nuestras leyes nacionales. Gracias. Thank you, Alberto. And in fact, um, he starts to go into some of the issues we'll be talking about in the second round. Um, we we want to talk about in the second round get a little more specific. Um, so we've asked each speaker to tell us one or two ideas of trade policies that could support climate action or one that gets in the way. And we'll be going in the same order uh, and hope each about five minutes. So Avi, can we hear from you? Sure. Um, oops, I'm unmuting myself. Um, and I'm starting a timer. Um, <laughs> This is, a, this is a fascinating discussion, and I'm delighted to hear the European a voice, a voice from Mexico, uh, and I'm also feeling what a number of speakers have hinted, and Karen, what, what you have mentioned explicitly, that this needs to be an even more global conversation. Uh, at The Leap, the organization that I work for, we have just launched a project with uh, a magnificent partner organization based in the UK called War on Want, uh, calling for a global Green New Deal. There was uh, a webinar with um, Assad Raymond, the ED of War on Want, uh, as well as my partner, Naomi Klein, and our great uh, friend and thinker, Arundhati Roy, earlier this week, starting to sketch the outlines for a global Green New Deal. And too many of the Green New Deal proposals, as they've emerged in North America and in Europe, have 
uh, proposed, and, and Karen, I will answer the call to be specific, although we're talking about massive change, the proposals of the Green New Deal in Europe and North America have been very focused on the nation state, on the changes necessary. For instance, the Green New Deal for housing, the first specific legislative proposal in the US Congress uh, for 12 million new units of non-market public housing, taking housing out of the market and really providing housing for all. These are important policies. They're specific policies. They work at the nexus of economic justice and climate justice, environmental justice. They try to address inequality and white supremacy and racism uh, with these big public run programs that we must have to secure a safe future. Um, but they're very focused on nation states and they're very focused um, on what we need to build in the new infrastructure. And there is massive new building that must take place. But we also have to factor in the implications for where those resources come from on a planet that is already over its carrying capacity seven or eight times. And can we have a Green New Deal with new transit systems, new energy systems, housing for all, and other universal public services that don't spark extraction explosions, particularly in countries of the global south, and deprive those countries of uh, environmental, uh, social, and economic rights as we seek them in countries of the global north? And so uh, uh, one appeal, uh, not specifically on the trade side, but on the Green New Deal side, is for us to continue to push ourselves to involve voices and priorities from social movements and civil society organizations in the Global South in this conversation. If we had that uh, uh, really in focus, it would help us on the trade side to start advocating for mechanisms in the global trading architecture where we could have alliances like we used to have, like we were just starting to form in the globalization debates of the late 90s, where countries and movements in the global south were coming together with social movement actors in the global north to fight together for a global trading system that would prioritize basic rights um, to basic services and to prioritize now uh, fighting the climate crisis on a global level. So something like, you know, I'm not a trade expert, unlike some others on this panel. But if we had a climate clause in every trade agreement, if we had campaigns and pressure from both countries and movements within countries to put a climate clause in every significant existing and future negotiated trade agreement that said exactly the reverse of what the trading system did to the climate negotiations in the early 90s, that said any provision of any global trading uh, uh, agreement that violates the fundamental right to the priority of public health, in other words, both the pandemic and the climate crisis fall in this lens of survival for life on earth, and this, what better meaning could there be for the notion of public health? If any provision of a trading agreement violates every country and people's right to measures that secure public health, whether that is vaccines and drugs and personal protective equipment and ventilators for a pandemic, or whether that is rapidly shifting energy, transportation, food and other systems to reduce emissions uh, massively and rapidly, um, then those provisions are not in effect if they have a negative impact on the future of life on earth. We need a climate clause like they inserted investor state dispute uh, mechanisms and others that are kind of like a dead man switch when, when, when something uh, threatens the life of, 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 the, of the conductor of the, of the train moving forward for, for planetary health, then a switch has to automatically uh, intervene in any trading system that prioritizes profit over what is necessary for living. So that's a big one that is also specific. Um, that I think some of our comrades who understand trade law better um, could, uh, could fashion into an actual instrument. And maybe even better for me than, as Alberto put it so, so perfectly, better than the specific mechanisms, the global movement connections that we need to start fighting back um, as, as, as connected movements across uh, international borders. Um, we need to rally around something really clear and really specific uh, that can help us campaign on all of each other's behalfs. Particularly, as Arthur said, 
because the right-wing authoritarian populists, not just Trump, but others, have managed to leverage the extraordinary failures of the international neoliberal uh, project to bring more people to their side that has no intention of dismantling those structures, that has no intention of bringing back those jobs. They have no intention of, of, of writing inequalities. In fact, they're shoveling money in, the, in this bailout program uh, by the truckful to their rich friends. Um, but they have been able to point out these very obvious things about how the promises of free trade have failed and the left needs to speak just as loudly, just as clearly, and just as simply about those failures, which we all know, and which the climate crisis and the pandemic show us are truly costing lives in the hundreds of thousands right now. And I don't see any argument more powerful than that. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, that's great. I, I mean, I completely agree. We need to be scaling back what's in these agreements and doing, but doing so not for, just from each country, uh, but through global movements. Um, so next we have Lucia. What would you think would be something bad that gets in the way or something that could be done differently? Hola de nuevo. Eh, pues respondiendo, bueno, un poco en línea de lo que hemos estado diciendo todos, yo creo que es verdad que es interesante estar teniendo el debate sobre el Pacto Verde Global a la vez que estamos hablando sobre cómo sería este sistema de comercio global, ¿no? Porque efectivamente incluso entre quienes reconocen que existe un problema climático, creo que las estrategias pueden ser también distintas, ¿no? En cuanto a plazos y métodos, ¿no? Es decir, eh, si entendemos o si nos ponemos en el punto de vista de que tenemos que desacelerar el cambio climático y eso pasa sí o sí por desinvertir en energías fósiles, eso sí o sí nos va a llevar a un cambio eh, económico, social y político tal cual lo conocemos, ¿no? Y desde mi punto de vista, realmente ahora mismo no creo que se, sería suficiente hablar sobre añadir salvaguardas, incluso aunque fueran vinculantes a los tratados de libre comercio, sino que lo que se tendría que hacer es limitar de manera bastante eh, fuerte lo que es el comercio global hoy en día, ¿no? Y invertir en otro tipo de economías, economías locales, apoyos en economías entre regiones, etcétera, ¿no? Eh, sin embargo, y vuelvo a la Unión Europea, es verdad que el camino que está llevando ahora mismo la Unión Europea es empujar hacia cada vez más negociaciones de acuerdos de libre comercio e impulsar el sistema de protección a las inversiones. ¿no? Eh, de hecho, hace unos días eh, el comisionario europeo Phil Hogan eh, reconoció que su estrategia o una de las maneras que él veía para salir de esta crisis actual pasa por incrementar el libre comercio y por firmar eh, nuevos acuerdos de, de libre comercio. ¿no? Entonces, de alguna manera, cuando vemos estos movimientos, realmente eh, esto deslegitima muchísimo cualquier política climática que esté queriendo llevar la Unión Europea o cualquier país, ¿no? Porque por un lado tenemos los acuerdos de París, los acuerdos climáticos, pero por otro lado tenemos eh, los, a, eh, la política comercial, que a veces parece que van en dos sentidos contrarios, ¿no? Es que incluso a veces parece que quienes defienden el comercio global, sabiendo a día de hoy lo que sabemos sobre los impactos en el clima, pareciera que se acercan mucho más a una visión negacionista de lo que es el cambio climático. ¿no? Eh, y si bien es verdad que podemos hablar sobre alternativas, y algunas son muy válidas, como las que comentaba eh, Abby ahora mismo, ¿no? también pues sí podemos hablar sobre cómo incluir impactos de, de riesgo ¿no? sobre el medio ambiente antes o durante eh, la implementación de los acuerdos, con una cláusula que obligue a que este acuerdo se cancela en el momento en el que esté violando uno de estos principios, podrían ser alternativas interesantes a explorar, pero sin olvidar que si no limitamos este comercio global, poco vamos a conseguir también, ¿no? Eh, por otro lado, sí que creo que ahora mismo es un momento interesante de debatir sobre el comercio global porque sí que está siendo objeto de críticas en el ámbito académico, en el ámbito social, incluso en algunas instituciones internacionales. ¿no? Y algunos países pues, están queriendo liderar estos debates. Eh, tenemos, por un lado, lo que ya comentaba, la Unión Europea 
con Estados Unidos o Japón tirando hacia el business as usual, ¿no? o sea, siguiendo por la misma estrategia de siempre, con algunos cambios procedimentales, pero que no son realmente sustanciales, y algunos países como India, Indonesia, que sí que están, eh, sí que están haciendo frente al problema, incluso decidiendo salirse de algunos acuerdos de comercio. ¿no? Eh, incluso interesante el ejemplo de Brasil, y con esto termino, es decir, Brasil no tiene firmados acuerdos de protección a las inversiones y sin embargo es uno de los países que más atracción eh, de inversión extranjera directa tiene en la región. ¿no? Entonces, creo que el debate, y lamentablemente no está siendo así en los debates sobre la reforma del sistema, es poner en el centro del debate para qué necesitamos estos acuerdos de libre comercio y sobre todo la protección a las inversiones. Creo que sería mucho más interesante debatir desde la raíz del problema antes de meternos a hablar sobre cómo podemos mejorar un sistema que estamos viendo que intrínsecamente es insostenible. Y nada, pues paso la palabra. Gracias. Gracias, Lucía. Um, those are important, important points. Um, I think we're certainly at a moment, especially with the COVID emergency, and this has come up in some of the other webinars, that there's no reason for us to accept that the agreements we have now are the way it has to be. Uh, I work on agriculture issues, and a lot of ideas in agriculture that were considered outlandish a couple of years ago are now on the table. Uh, and so I think you know we, it is time to think boldly Uh, about how this could be different, um, both structure of the agreements and their content. So next I have Arthur. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I'll start by saying, I think there's been a lot of good thinking by green groups on this question of how trade policy could be used to support climate solutions. Uh, and if you want to dig into what US groups have been working on, Uh, I encourage you to start with the Sierra Club's discussion paper, uh, A New Climate-Friendly Approach to Trade. Um, there's, a, there's a good deal of, of detail in that, and I will provide the link in the chat um, after I've spoken. Uh, but that paper aside, let me just highlight a few core thoughts um, that have pretty, pretty broad support among progressive groups in the U.S. working on trade. Um, you know, first of all, There's, there's broad agreement that there needs to be a broad carve out in all trade agreements that recognizes the primacy of climate solutions over commercial interests. I mean, a number of people have spoken about this. It needs to be uh, you know, an explicit exemption for domestic and international climate policies to be completely exempt from any sort of trade deal challenge, whether that be state to state challenges or challenges brought by corporations under investor state dispute settlement, uh, which is something that we oppose overall anyhow. Um, so number one, you know, very broad agreement, climate policies need to be untouchable from harm by trade pacts. Uh, going beyond that, the US view, um, which I think we've already heard may not be shared internationally, um, is that the teeth in trade agreements, the enforcement teeth that we've heard uh, so many people talk about already Um, is something that we should actually consider using to enforce internationally agreed upon climate pacts, um, be that the Paris Accords or some future climate agreement. Um, you know, as others have said, one of the novel things about trade agreements um, that isn't necessarily found in other types of international agreements uh, is that they do have these enforcement mechanisms built right into them, um, such that if you violate the terms, there can be millions, if not billions of dollars of penalty imposed upon your country to try to force you to get back with the program. Uh, and thus far, these enforcement mechanisms have always been used to enforce things like intellectual property rights or so-called investor rights, things we don't agree with. Um, but in the U.S., the, the view tends to be among progressives that we, these enforcement mechanisms should be used to enforce labor rights and environmental rights and human rights and things of that nature. So that's, that's my second point. Um, and number three is related to that. And it's something that, you know, maybe there isn't broad agreement on among US groups, but there's at least been some thinking about, and I just wanted to raise it. And that's the idea of carbon border adjustments. 
Um, carbon border adjustments are something that I first heard about almost 15 years ago in a presentation at the CTC conference by representatives of Friends of the Earth US and the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers. So again, one of these unusual alliances. Uh, and the idea behind a carbon border adjustment is, um, you know, if a country is importing goods from a product whose climate policies, you know, haven't reached a, a level that people agree they should be at, you know, you charge a tax on that import. And maybe you don't call it a tax, the lawyers and the policy wants to have uh, views for why you might not call it a tax. But the thought here is, you know, these taxes, for lack of a better term, um, you know, are going to help dissuade rich countries from just dumping their carbon pollution uh, onto poor countries via outsourcing, you know, manufacturing. And simultaneously, um, for groups that care about, you know, the outsourcing of jobs and the race to the bottom, you know, one of those draws for outsourcing is eliminated. Uh, and back 15 years ago, carbon border adjustments were largely viewed and largely discussed as a way to restrict carbon intensive manufactured goods uh, from entering the US from China. Today, I tend to hear about them more in terms of preventing you know, carbon intensive US goods from entering Europe. Uh, but in any event, you know, these are mechanisms that could be used to pressure outlier nations like the US at this point uh, to get with the program, adopt better climate policies. And, you know, thought can also be given to where the funds that are raised from the, these uh, border adjustments get devoted. So in a perfect world, this could be for things like, you know, just transition domestically, uh, but also potentially for richer nations to begin repaying some of the carbon debts internationally, um, you know, funding technology transfer or, or direct payments or what have you. Um, so uh, I think I went a little over my time last time. I'll pause here um, and I will provide the link to that paper. Thanks, Arthur. Um, Alberto. And then after this round, we'll be looking at some of the questions and answers. Um, it is easiest for us to find them if you put your questions and answers in that section rather than in the chat, but we'll try and look both places. Alberto. cinco minutos que quedan es difícil enriquecer lo que ya ustedes dijeron creo que hay una coincidencia muy muy grande en lo que se está planteando ¿no? quizá creo que debíamos empezar a pensar y más allá de lo que yo había pensado decir en esta parte quisiera centrarme en, en el reto organizativo en el reto de unidad creo que no vamos a poder avanzar si cada sector o cada país lucha, así sea por los mismos objetivos. No es posible dar la lucha eh, por sector o por país en estos temas. O la damos globalmente o no vamos a ganar. Y además la, ha sido la experiencia comprobada, ¿no? Si se ha logrado estancar la OMC, ¿no? Desde SEAS pues, logramos parar los acuerdos y las negociaciones subsiguientes que no pudieron meter los temas de Singapur, que no pudieron avanzar, que está de alguna manera estancada, fue porque había una organización global. ¿no? Si pudimos parar el ALCA, en el caso de América, ¿no? fue porque había una organización global. Y no solo foros globales, quizás más conocido el Foro Económico, el Foro Social Mundial, pero era un foro solamente. La Alianza Social Continental, con los efectos que tuvo y las limitaciones que tuvo, que no es el momento de hablar ahorita de ella, pero hay que reconocer que los tuvo, era una organización con planes de acción, no solo de discusión. Entonces creo que tenemos, no es repetible la experiencia que tuvimos en los 90, en que pudimos congelar eh, la OMT, la Organización Mundial de Comercio, o parar el ALCA, o parar algunos acuerdos bilaterales de inversión eh, y de libre comercio. Hay que evaluar esas experiencias, pero no podemos repetirlas. Creo que la situación ha cambiado. No es factible organizarnos de la misma manera. Pero creo que el gran reto no es tener alternativas. Si uno los oye a ustedes, o bueno, ve uno la cantidad de escritos que hay, alternativas hay. Están claras, están elaboradas. Podemos perfeccionarlas, podemos enriquecerlas. 
pero hay una enorme cantidad de propuestas que parten de esto. Tenemos que pensar fuera del marco, tenemos que pensar un sistema distinto y que son viables. Y lo que, para que algo sea viable se necesita la guarda para hacerlo viable. Y entonces creo que es el momento de volver a pensar en cómo nos organizamos internacionalmente para hacer que estas propuestas realmente sean viables. ¿no? La mejor de las propuestas del mundo es un bonito libro si no tiene un sujeto atrás capaz de llevarlo a la práctica. ¿no? Entonces yo quisiera simplemente introducir el tema para otras reuniones, para otros momentos, para no repetir lo que muchos de ustedes ya dijeron. Tenemos que pensar cómo reorganizamos el movimiento global, integral, en el que cruce las especialidades que cada quien la seguirá teniendo, pero al mismo tiempo sea una lucha común. Gracias. Thanks, Alberto. Um, we are going into the question and answer part now. And I think I'd like to start with one that follows on this point Alberto just made um, about organizing uh, internationally, because it's certainly true there are proposals. In fact, some of us on this call were involved in, with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in developing alternative proposals to NAFTA a year or two ago. There's a lot out there, different ideas about how this could be approached, um, but we need to be thinking both about the what and the how. Uh, so we have a question from Yui Union. Uh, he says, or he or she, I don't know, Arthur mentioned that we won on trade issues at the turn of the century. He mentioned the creative use of actions around the WTO meeting to drive home these, these ideas. In general, the panelists are talking about negotiations over these trade deals themselves, but left leaders are not at the table during these negotiations. How can we move more people into action to get what we need? The youth climate movement is inspiring, but has been halted by COVID-19. We're hindered by the fact that corporations are happy to keep negotiating behind closed doors. How can we exercise power while sheltering at home? And before I open that up to answers, I, I would mention that specifically the U.S. is negotiating with Kenya, will be soon, and is already negotiating with the U.K., so they are definitely moving forward. Um, do I have a volunteer among the panelists, someone who would like to take on take up this subject. Maybe Arthur to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I'm not going to be able to address all those uh, themes raised in there, but I will say, um, I think one of the things that we need to do uh, to try to wrestle back some of the space that the right has claimed on trade policy is start not just critiquing trade agreements, but promoting our vision for alternatives. Um, this is something that, you know, was done quite a bit uh, at, at the turn of the century, uh, and that we've gotten away from in, in certain respects, um, at least on a broad scale. And so, uh, I, you know, I would like to see uh, a lot more forward thinking proposals from a unified left uh, across sectors and across borders that attempts to capture people's imaginations, like, you know, in the US context, the Green New Deal, Medicare for All similar ideas have started to capture people's imaginations and give us a vision for what we're fighting for. Um, I think that would be really critical to, um, you know, again, fighting back for some of the space that, that Trump and, and, and Trump types have captured recently. Um, and I think, you know, a couple of the ways to do that, as I said in my earlier comments, are number one, to expand um, representations of who trade policy is hurting in the US, so that it's not just, you know, white guys my age and older, um, but it's actually people of color and young people and women, um, and not just people in the US, but people around the world uh, who are hurt by these, these trade deals that, you know, in the US are, you know, primarily viewed as just outsourcing jobs. Um, and also, you know, as, as the uh, brother or sister from the UE mentioned, um, getting youth climate activists and others to broaden their analysis of, of what trade policy means in terms of the harm it causes to the climate justice movement, but also, you know, the potential of what we could be fighting for. Other people can answer how we organize power during COVID. Uh, 
I'm happy to jump in with a quick reflection, uh, Karen. Sure. Uh, first of all, ahead. I just I just have to say, uh, as a human on this call, this is my first Zoom call with translation, and wow, it is amazing. So a huge thank you and kudos to the superb language justice translating collective that is. I would love them to get a proper plug at, at the end of this uh, uh, webinar because it's really a pleasure to be able to speak across languages with such, uh, with such great professionals um, and experts. So I think one thing that's a, a little bit missing for me in this conversation, but I expect everyone will agree, is that we need to speak to the unprecedented political moment that we are in. We are not in, obviously we're not in the late 90s, nor are we in the Green New Deal moment of 2018, 2019, as it was playing out in the United States and to some degree in Europe and the UK. We are in an unprecedented global moment of crisis in which the rules that have been brutally imposed over the last half century of the neoliberal triumph have been temporarily suspended. I think we're, that, that, that's not like a blanket true statement, but like everything is happening at once right now. Hundreds of billions of public dollars are being shoveled to the richest 0.1% of the population and to the biggest multinational corporations. At the same time, rich countries are wantonly violating all of the trade <laughs> principles that they have been locking in for the rest of the world over the last decades. Companies are being nationalized. Whole industries are being nationalized in some rich companies. Factories are being expropriated, taken into public ownership in order to manufacture life-saving equipment. We have governments that are paying the salaries of employees in local uh, and international companies. We are in a moment where the rules have been suspended as the global economy has been suspended. And we on the left need to speak clearly and powerfully to this moment when we see so many of the myths of the neoliberal period laid bare. It turns out that austerity was always a cruel and punitive choice by governments used to attack the poor, and the marginalized communities in every country and globally. There are trillions and trillions of dollars available in public money that can be spent on health, education, the welfare of people, income supports, and, the, and an inclusive economy that genuinely provides basic public services for all. We know that now and nobody can deny it. And so we have to step into this political moment with real courage and clarity to claim this ideological terrain that has suddenly opened up before us. And there is so much forward momentum we can make. And at the same time, in this unprecedented moment, the, 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 the towering forces of the global economy are also moving quickly to swallow up this new terrain that has opened. I'm in New Jersey. Uh, a Canadian living in New Jersey. Next door in New York State, uh, just a, a week and a half ago, the governor of New York State invited the former CEO of Google, invited Bill Gates, invited Michael Bloomberg to radically reshape the economic future of New York State in the name of high-tech solutions to education, the provision of healthcare, and others, right? So we have big tech, the Amazons and Googles and other high-tech companies of the world who are now the richest and most powerful companies in the 21st century, moving in quickly to make an offer that preys on our terror in this time of pandemic, that they are going to take over a touchless, human-free, no-contact economy that makes people feel safe. It is truly uh, uh, terrifying the way they are presenting a dehumanized future to us to prey on our fears in this moment. But they recognize that everything, as the name of this whole series uh, recognizes, that everything is in play in this moment. So I just wanna uh, have a really clear call for truly radical and game-changing demands because the floor is open and if we don't take it, we know who will. 
Thanks, Avi. Did anyone else want to weigh in on this particular issue or should we move on? Uh, Lucia? Yeah, o sea, I, uh, perdón, en español. Solo quería hacer el punto que, que si bien es verdad que estoy de acuerdo que, que este es un momento histórico y clave en el que tenemos que estar muy, que tenemos que prestar mucha atención, eh, también es verdad que hay que tener en cuenta que o prestar también atención que aunque los estados puedan salir fortalecidos de esto, viendo las medidas que se están tomando, también hay que tener en cuenta que muchas medidas también están siendo de criminalizar y de militarizar mucho más eh, las sociedades y esto también es responsabilidad de los estados. Entonces, la salida tiene que ser igualmente de, fuerte, de estados fuertes, pero también con un fortalecimiento de, de lo comunitario, de lo social y que haya como mucha más implicación de de estos aspectos, ¿no? Y, y es verdad que, o sea, sí, estamos proponiendo alternativas sobre cómo podemos hacer para que no solamente estemos siempre reaccionando hacia acuerdos de libre comercio, pero creo que van a ser dos batallas que van a tener que convivir. Porque, por un lado, estos acuerdos siguen eh, moviéndose y siguen habiendo negociaciones y tenemos que paralizarlas. La Unión Europea está negociando ahora mismo con Mercosur, con México eh, y ha reiniciado las conversaciones con Estados Unidos. Entonces, tenemos que prestar atención a eso de una manera más reaccionaria, pero a la vez eh, empezar a hablar sobre otro tipo de medidas que realmente las alternativas más interesantes suelen estar fuera del marco de lo que son los tratados de, de comercio, sino que tienen que ver más con los sistemas más macroeconómicos o políticas locales que no muchas veces tienen que ver con, precisamente con estos acuerdos. ¿no? Incluso, más bien, y con esto termino, a veces los acuerdos de comercio se pueden presentar como obstáculos para llevar a cabo este otro tipo de, de propuestas alternativas de, de economías locales, por ejemplo. ¿no? Eh, y con esto termino. Gracias. Thank you. Um, you know, I do think it, I want to call out the issue of translation and the fact that we have people from other countries <clears throat> on this call. I've been conscious that during this moment of the COVID emergency, you know, we have been focusing on things like the safety of the meat workers, you know, which has become so apparent, you know, in this process, things that are happening within our own country. But I think we're not hearing enough about how this is playing out internationally and how these new proposals, the political space that might exist, looks elsewhere. Alberto, I don't know if you want to add anything right now about that issue, or perhaps we can move on to another question. I can't hear you. Yes, that or no? Yeah. Ay, y ahora sí. Tenemos que crear un espacio para discutir formas de organización o de interconexión entre nosotros. No creo que ahorita se pueda este, avanzar más. Y lo único que yo quisiera agregar es eh, que toque este tema, pero quizá otros que nuestros compañeros que están participando lo van a sacar, es cómo enfrentar la la recuperación económica después de la crisis de la pandemia. Las posturas de los estados y las posturas de las empresas es más de lo mismo. Buscar de nuevo que los estados hagan salvamentos millonarios a las empresas y la gente se va para pues, saber qué hace. En México, con todos los límites que tiene López Obrador, no vamos a hacer ahorita un panegírico López Obrador, pero está intentando enfrentarlo de otra manera. Si salvamos a la gente, se salvan las empresas. Si la gente tiene con qué vivir, va a jalar al conjunto de la economía. Entonces, toda la política social va a tratar de salvar a las pequeñas, medianas y a la gente, y no a las empresas. Pero eso hace que aquí esté hablando de cómo tumbarlo, cómo derrocarlo al presidente que ha tenido más votación en la historia del país, ¿no? Entonces creo que vamos a enfrentar un periodo muy difícil en el que algunos estados, quizás no Estados Unidos y Canadá, pero sí Ecuador, sí Chile, eh, 
que están aprendiendo en la pandemia de cómo controlar a la población. O sea, lograron tenernos en nuestra casa 24 horas del día, ¿no? Y eso para ellos es fundamental. El miedo logró lo que nunca en su vida habían logrado. Entonces, ¿cómo salir de nuevo sin descuidar nuestra salud y reorganizarnos? Entonces, creo que ahí hay dos retos. Uno, ¿cómo nos organizamos para las cosas globales? Pero también, ¿cómo intervenimos en la salida eh, con objetivos populares de la crisis que se viene después de, de que se acabe propiamente la pandemia? Okay, I'm going to go on to have time for a few more questions. Um, we will be going until, well, 12 more minutes, 12.30 in, in my time. Um, so here's one from London GND, I assume Green New Deal. Uh, and it's pushing back a little bit on one of the comments. Um, Avi and Arthur mentioned a climate clause in trade agreements. Are they not concerned that this would give trade agreements even more power than they already have? Trade agreements have been attracting other areas of public policy because they have teeth. There's another argument that says issues like climate, intellectual property, digital rights should be removed from trade agreements and trade agreements should be made subservient to climate goals and human rights commitments. I guess we'd start with Arthur or Avi if you have any response to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can start and I'll say absolutely we agree that um, trade agreements should be subservient to uh, climate goals um, and, and climate agreements and climate policies, both at the international level and also at the, at the domestic and, and local level. Um, I think that there's broad agreement among that in the U.S. Um, I think there is some disagreement uh, around this idea of whether trade agreements themselves can be good for anything other than, you know, tariffs and quotas on, on goods and services moving across borders. Um, and again, our view is that, you know, let's create the trade agreements that we want uh, and that we think are beneficial. Um, and for us, you know, having seen for 25 years, these trade agreements used to be promote used to promote things that really have nothing to do with trade, like, you know, copyrights and patents uh, and other, you know, so-called so investor rights. Well, why can't we use those to promote worker rights and climate rights and other environmental rights and human rights? And there is broad, you know, there isn't broad agreement around that internationally, but, you know, that's sort of the hope that a lot of, um, U.S. NGOs and labor organizations and others that have been working on trade uh, bring to the table right now. And, you know, I will say um, I don't think we're, we've gotten there or that we're anywhere near getting there yet, but um, that, that's the vision that we have been pushing. Uh, second, the agreement that the spirit of that question is one I, I, I hope we all really agree with. It, it is absolutely I don't, I don't propose something like a climate clause in the spirit of a technocratic, you know, fix to an architecture which is otherwise serving the cause of life and justice. The entire system is corrupt and is replicating on every level uh, a murderous logic, which is stealing lives in real time in this pandemic, as it has always, particularly in countries of the global south that still subsidize the economies of the global north through trade agreements, but other international financial mechanisms to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars every year in the international financial flows. The rich world is rich because the global south continues to keep paying it year after year after year. And so we can't be talking about quick or incremental fixes to one piece of the system like uh, trade agreements. We need debt jubilees and cancellation. We need wholesale change to the values and the logic of the system itself. I just wanna to return to the pandemic for a moment because I think we have to keep remembering the context that we're in. And Alberto started to touch on this. In this moment of pause, people are recognizing what is essential. And it turns out that what is essential is first of all, the workers who are the most marginalized and precarious in all of our economies, 
who are providing, who are seeding and picking and packing the food, who are distributing it, workers who are keeping systems running. I think we've recognized globally that the internet is the very definition of a necessary public service and should be provided as a free universal utility uh, in all places in the world and to all people uh, in the event that it is needed in moments like this by so many. Uh, and you know, it's just becoming clear to so many people what we really value. What we miss the most is not shopping, but hugging our friends and our family. And the, and the centering that is happening, the spiritual clarity of this moment of what we really need and what we really want and what the global economy should serve is I think a really strong place for left movements to build from. I think this pandemic has been an incredible teacher as much as it has been a, a terrorizing force. And I, I just wanna echo all calls to, to build from where we are because the possibilities seem limitless now. Um, did anyone else want to touch on this one? I have maybe one question and then I think we'll go to final comments. Um, so here's one that I think um, might be addressed to Alberto to start with. It's on sort of the institutional issues. Um, the WTO has lost legitimacy for global South countries and also for the free trade enthusiasts, glo global North countries like the US who seek to advance ultra neoliberal deals outside of the WTO. In the vision of trade in a global Green New Deal, is there a role for a multilateral institution at the global or regional levels? Do we reform or abolish it? And if needed, how can we prevent more powerful and wealthier countries from exploiting their power to reproduce the unequal relationships we see in FTAs and in the WTO? It's a big question, um, but on this, this issue of governance. Es una pregunta bastante amplia y ha sido muy discutida en los movimientos. Necesitamos simplemente abolir estas instituciones multilaterales de gobernancia global de la economía. Este, bueno, eso es un asunto táctico. Yo creo que la economía, el mundo está interconectado, nos guste o no nos guste. Que tenemos que volver a poner el acento, en la, sobre todo en alimentos y una serie de cosas, en las economías locales. Sí, estoy de acuerdo. Pero de que el mundo está conectado, interconectado y va a seguir interconectado, es una realidad. Y que en ese sentido necesita reglas mínimas de gobernanza de esas relaciones internacionales. Entonces, la discusión es si se pueden transformar estas instituciones o hay que crear otras. Pero lo que creo que no, por lo menos yo no lo veo así, que podamos prescindir de algún tipo de espacios donde se pueda regular la economía internacional. Eso lo necesitamos. La pregunta es si es viable transformar la OMC en algo radicalmente distinto o para poder crear algo radicalmente distinto, tenemos que acabar con la OMC. Es una pregunta política de táctica, creo yo. Pero lo que creo que nos hace daño es que a veces pensamos, hay que acabar con la OMC. Sí, está bien, si quieres acabamos con la OMC y con los tratados de libre comercio. Pero ¿cómo vamos a regular relaciones de poder asimétrico entre los países? Porque es una realidad, es la asimetría de poder entre los distintos países que formamos esta gran telaraña de relaciones internacionales. Necesitamos algún tipo de acuerdos vinculantes. ¿no? Entonces, bueno, es un asunto de discutir tácticamente cómo lo hacemos. No sé si contesté un poco a tu pregunta, Karen. It is a hard question. I think it's more, I think those are important observations as we move forward. Um, I think we need to move into a final uh, round of responses from the panelists. We have so many good questions here. Um, I will encourage people to attend the following sessions um, and we may decide to add more um, if, if there's interest. Um, but I guess I would ask um, first from Lucia, we haven't heard from you for a while, maybe you can start 
Any final comments you'd like to make? Um, well, I, I'm gonna speak in English now for some reason, but thanks for the translators. Um, I agree with Avi, I think it's an extremely hard work. Um, especially when we start the conversation discussions, we want to speak quick. So, so thanks for, for having patience on that. Um, I just shared um, uh, a link to a, a research that we just did. And I will finalize with this because I know that the next webinar is going to be specific on investment dispute settlements and investment protection. So I think it's a good way to introduce into the subject. So we did a, yeah, we just did a, a research analyzing um, what the investment lawyers are actually already assessing their clients, which are investors or multinational companies, on how they can start preparing to sue states over COVID-19 response measures. So I think this is quite a scandal, but it's not, it does not really come as a surprise since actually some of the investment lawyers um, have stated that they follow crises in countries because it's when they can also start cashing in money and making profit from the crisis using these investment protection systems, which are part of um, the investment agreements and some trade agreements that have investment protection clauses. So I just wanted to finalize also sharing something that is very current right now. It's something that might or might not happen, but it still raises the question of why do these investment systems have to exist in the first place? And yeah, like why, as Alberto was already saying, like we do have to give some kind of judicial, juridical security to investors, but not necessarily for this special uh, treatment and, and giving them the special privileges. So um, thanks for inviting me and I'm looking forward for the next conversation to talk more in depth about these investment protection systems. Thank you. So I realize we are actually kind of out of time. So I'm gonna urge uh, our next panel, the panelists who are left to tell us what you see as the most crucial issue or a crucial issue to move forward on soon. Maybe it's process, maybe it's a theme. Um, anyway, something we should be thinking about as we move forward or tell us about a publication we should see. And then we want to mention something I think uh, Aaron can tell us perhaps uh, about some other webinars that are coming up. So Arthur. Yeah, thank you. And let me echo my thanks to the organizers and the interpreters. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, you know, I think just the, the closing thing I'll say is um, I agree with Avi and everyone else that the COVID pandemic um, is an opportunity for us. And I'll say uh, in the United States context anyways, it is an opportunity that is not being grabbed with both hands yet. Uh, and so the more that we can do um, to, to increase analysis and, and promote forward thinking policies right now, we should be doing. And I think in the US, we need to learn a lot more from what people are having success with in other countries, because uh, there's, a, there's a lack of leadership right now uh, on these issues here. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Alberto, any brief words? Sí, muy, muy breve. Creo que la pandemia es una oportunidad de cambio, pero también ellos están tratando de usarla como una oportunidad de consolidar y profundizar aún más en el mismo modelo. Creo que hay una nueva conciencia en una parte amplia de la sociedad, no demasiado amplia, pero amplia, en que no podemos seguir viviendo igual que aquí se habla de no volver a la normalidad, sino una nueva normalidad. Que no es posible que después de que se acabe, digamos, la infección masiva, volvamos al mismo estilo de vida. Creo que tenemos el gran reto, y es enorme el reto, cómo aprovechar este momento para que la gente dé un salto en la conciencia, para darse cuenta que o hacemos algo o este planeta nos va a comer. Nos va a acabar. Gracias. Thanks, Alberto. Avi, 
Any final words? Sure. We're in overtime here, so I will actually be brief. Um, in terms of things to check out, it, this is, seems like an opportune moment to plug the project that I was talking about earlier that The Leap is doing with War on Want that we've just launched. You can learn more and sign up at globalgnd.org. I do think it's time for a renewed internationalism. People are communicating digitally. <laughs> they're exchanging more in this moment. Uh, across uh, across the internet uh, and all borders, which are constructs, colonial constructs anyway. Um, so I think this is a moment when we need to get ready. We know what happens next. We're not moving from this pandemic into a socialist paradise. We're moving into a long <coughs> economic crisis, perhaps worse than any we've seen in modern times. And the hammer is going to come down and it's gonna come down hardest on the people who are already suffering uh, the most. So we, we need to move fast because there are, the opportunities are, are not gonna be hanging there forever. So I think conversations like this one are really urgent um, as we connect and, and try to form uh, international connections. I'm really grateful to be uh, on uh, in this conversation with the great Alberto and, and Lucia and Arthur. Uh, and Karen, thank you for your excellent moderating. And one more, Muchísimas gracias to the translators. I agree. The, the translation has been a huge help. Um, I think Aaron was going to tell us, uh, remind us of some of the other webinars that are coming up. First, we are passing it to Pau, okay. who will give an um, overview of the interpretation and translators. Great. Hi, everyone. This is Pau. Um, my name is Pao Lebron. I am one of the language justice workers with, as I mentioned, uh, Babilla Collective or Colectivo Babilla. Um, just wanted to give you all more information. Thank you for the recognition uh, for the hard work interpretation entails. Um, we were established um, in 2019, but we are a three a person group of language workers who have been interpreting for over five years. We are a collective of trans feminist, anti-racist language workers. We come from experiences of migration and diaspora, and we focus on supporting cultural, community organizing, political spaces to prioritize and practice language justice through a lens of gender inclusivity, decolonization, and language determination. So, you know, just a few things, um, but we are very happy to be here. Um, thank you. If you want to know any more, anything else about us, you can reach out to Aaron for more information. Again, we are um, Babilla Collective or Colectivo Babilla. Thank you again. And then the last thing to plug will be our next webinars, which will be on Tuesday um, at 11 a.m., which will be uh, continuing the Brussels series, um, which will be about energy. And then on Thursday, um, as has been mentioned before, will be at the same time on hard law and soft law, our continuation of our trade series, all under the banner of with everything up for grabs. So thank you all so much for coming and I'll pass it back to Karen for just a close up if, if necessary. I think we're good. This has been a fantastic discussion. Um, I hope we can continue these kinds of conversations um, and, and see how we move forward. Thanks everyone.